chapter 11. In certain traditional accounts, Orpheus is depicted as the grandson of the king Charops, to whom Dionysus, when invading Europe from Asia, has given the kingdom and has taught the mystic rites of initiation related to the later mysteries of Eleusis. Orpheus himself almost merged with the lyre-playing god Apollo, and consequently he was able to charm all nature and tame the wild beasts with his playing and singing. His sacred incantations, Hieron Epaudon, Hieron Epaudon, and prayers, Euchai, birds and animals came to hear Orpheus's music, and even trees were calmed. One should remember that dancing and flute or lyre music were traditional parts of the sacrificial cult of Apollo, and these Apollonian musical rituals held a privileged place in the ancient Hellenic religion. According to Johannes Quisten, from Music and Worship in Pagan and Christian Antiquity, 1983 pages 10 and 17, Orpheus was considered by the ancient world to be the representative of cultic music. Music had the same character of epiclesis. It was supposed to call down the good gods, because song and music increased the efficacy of the epiclesis. The words of epiclesis were nearly always sung to instrumental accompaniment. Thus the Dionysian fellowship used the so-called humnoi kletikoi of women in order to obtain the appearance of their god. The practice of Pythagorean and Platonic philosophy is itself tantamount to the singing of rationally composed anagogic hymns, thus imitating Apollo, the leader of the Muses. The Muses are equated with the anagogion phos, the elevating light that kindles the soul with anagogion pua, the upward leading fire. For Proclus, the prayer-like hymns are theurgical instruments, and human philosophy is an imitation of Apollo's hymns. Orpheus, as the paradigmatic itinerant seer, is credited for the ability to pacify through his music, to heal, to foretell the future and interpret the past, as well as shape the traditions of the gods, theology in the form of myths, spells and epic songs. Arguing that both Thales and Orpheus's music worked magic, Netta Ronan attributes special healing powers to the Song of Orpheus as it is described by Apollonius Rhodius. Presumably the theogony which he performed itself had the power to restore cosmic and social harmony. Plato's dialogues themselves may be viewed as a product of musical madness, constructed following the rules of dialectical reasoning and logic, hence philosophy. Pardon me. Hence, philosophy, as an artful strategy of recollection and restoration of vision, is related to the performance arts of dancing and love poetry. Both philosophical dialectic and esoterically interpreted myth produce the Logos, which is an image of the higher noetic and henetic reality. This reality itself is beyond the adequate capture either by Muthos or by Logos, each of which are by degrees representations, plausible Icos, perhaps, but ultimately open to the risk of deception or misinterpretation. Likewise, with a similar imaginative splendour, the ineffable essence of wisdom, if not of being, may be revealed by the cosmic choreography and theurgic music of the calendrical festivals and seasons. This kind of telestic dance theatre is established for the sake of the circular descent and ascent, manifestation and return to the source. According to Gregory Shaw, quoting from Theurgy and the Soul, the Neoplatonism of Iamblichus, 1995 pages 175 to 77, Musical theurgy was a form of anamnesis that awakened the soul to its celestial identity with the gods. Musical theurgy came from the gods and gave the soul direct contact with them. According to Iamblichus, Pythagoras was the first composer of this anagogic music. 
The sacred names and incantations used in theurgic invocations also originated from the gods. And Iamblichus says the Egyptian prophet, Bittus, revealed the name of the god that pervades the entire cosmos. For Iamblichus, the god whose name pervaded the cosmos was Helios. Man's prayers must therefore be presented to Helios through the many zodiacal schemata that the god assumes. Iamblichus says, The Egyptians employ these sorts of prayers to Helios not only in their visions, but also in their more ordinary prayers that have the same kind of meaning, and they are offered to God according to the symbolic mystagogy. In the later Pythagorean milieu, the seven strings of Orpheus's lyre are connected with the seven circles of heaven, suggesting that the souls need the cathara in order to ascend. The theory of the seven vowels and the seven-string cosmic lyre, relating to the different planets, colours, sounds and the seasonal rotation of the year, is perhaps of Babylonian origin. It is also related to Egypt as the ultimate source of the main, or at least initial, esoteric principles of esoteric Orphic law. The use of lyre or cathara music during the rites of ascension is attested along with the mantric intoning of the seven vowels that allegedly enabled the soul to escape the darkness of the irrational lower existence and return to the divine realm from which it initially descended. The theurgic way of the Orphic Bakchea, initiation, recollection, reintegration, elevation, to the solar noetic realm, is provided for the Orphic and Bacchic initiates, Orphicoi, Bacchoi, those who looked to Orpheus as their prophet and practiced Bios Orphicos, or Bios Puthagoricos. The Egyptian provenance of this purificatory way of life, and here it is only the archetypal ideal, not the actual transmission that matters, is affirmed by Herodotus when he speaks about the Egyptian custom of wearing linen tunics. They agree in this with the observances which are called Orphic and Bacchic, but are in fact Egyptian and Pythagorean. Bukert also recognised that although Orpheus wove together and melded different Near Eastern traditions, Akkadian, Hurite, Hittite, the Egyptian metaphysical and cultist the Egyptian metaphysical and cultic tradition is used most of all. It is evident that not only Egyptian cosmologies, but also the royal paths of salvation, popularised through the temple initiations, hermeneutical instructions and educational programmes related to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, are reshaped and reused, though for the Greek audience the Egyptian illustrations quote, seem to be even more suggestive than the Egyptian formulas. End quote. 